Good morning. Welcome to the stream, our time of worship together at First Christian Church here in Union. And we are so glad that you're with us this morning and celebrating another day of worship and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, if you're watching on Facebook, you already know how to get there, but there may be some that do not know how to get to Facebook, and you can share uh, some of this information with them. Facebook.com forward slash FCC Union. Just don't assume that people know that, that you may know about and connected with in the body of Christ here. You can share that with them. Also, if you're getting the first to know the midweek email, it comes into your, to your computer, to your email box there. You can, there's a link there. You can click on that and you can connect here. It'll take that person to uh, the, the worship service of the stream. So let them know that that's another way they can do that if they're not quite connected with Facebook. A couple other little pieces of information here. We have a brand new website and it's been redesigned and, and new laid out with new directions. Uh, it's really an attractive website. Share this with people at FCCUnion.org. You can go there, check it out, look at look it over. We'd be, really be great for more feedback from you to take a look at that website. And on that website, there's two buttons. You just kind of scroll down on the first page there. There's two buttons, one that says Facebook uh, for uh, for Facebook stream, and there's another one for YouTube stream. And, uh, and there's two buttons there. You can click on one of those buttons. It'll take you there. Just follow the prompts, help you set up with Facebook. The other one will help you set up to find, be able to connect with, with YouTube. And talking about YouTube, uh, you can go to youtube.com and you can do a search for First Christian Union. Look for our logo there. Click on that. You can open that up. When you get there, that'll take you to our YouTube uh, site. And what we need on YouTube right now is subscribers. We have to have uh, over 100 subscribers to be, be able to get the URL. A and right now we need 47 more. So we need 47 more subscribers. And what we need to do right now, if you just go to YouTube, connect there, and we'll be able to get that a lot more in a simpler form of the URL. So check that out on YouTube. And, uh, and we're also going to be loading up more content on, you, on YouTube. There'll be more devotions, there'll be sermons, and there'll be other information there. So this will give us another way to communicate to you and to the community. So that'll help us out a great deal. We're really grateful for this opportunity that God has provided in working together to provide this capability of giving you a message here this morning and being able to worship together. So what we're going to do in just a few moments, we're going to have different people uh, on our staff here will be sharing, our, our youth, our children's director, our youth pastor. We're going to be hearing from Rob, our worship leader, and also from John. And we'll be hearing from uh, the message of God here this morning. And just we rejoice in your presence with us. And as we begin this morning, let's join together in prayer. Shall we pray together? Gracious Lord, we are so grateful and thankful that you have brought us together in the name of Christ. And Lord, in the troubled times and difficult times, Lord, we rejoice that you are the God of the heavens and the earth. And Lord, you have made us and formed us, and you have promised to be with us always. And even right now, this day, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, happy Sunday. Kids, this part is for you. Oh my goodness! Did you say this part was for kids? <laughs> yes! We have a new friend! What's your name? Hi, kids. Well, well, good morning, Miss Christine. My friends call me Tammy T. Tammy T, it's nice to meet you. What does the T stand for? Well, uh, my birth certificate says Taylor, but my mama says it should be Temptation, because uh -oh. I'm always having a hard time staying out of trouble. Oh, man. You know what I'm struggling with right now, Miss Christine? Um, what are you struggling with? Well, ever since they canceled school, my parents have been telling me to go to bed at 930. But, well, I really just want to stay up all night and eat all the snacks I can find. Oh man, that is a temptation, isn't it? It really is. And, and I just want to grab my mama's phone <laughs> and stay up all night watching YouTube. But then I don't want to get up in the morning or do Bible study or do video church or work on schoolwork or chores or anything. I just want to sleep all day. 
Oh my goodness, that is a temptation. Yes, yes it is. You know, I have to make a confession. I kept Sally Sunday up all night long last night, and when she got, she, she got in big, big trouble because of me, is, is there someone in the Bible that can help me know what to do when I feel temptation? Oh, you know what, Tammy, there is. Someone from our story today can help you with that. But before we get to our story, let's do our Bible verse and let's Ooh. talk about that verse. Okay, yeah, let's do our Bible verse. All right, so here we go. Our Bible verse this morning is from the book of John, chapter 3, verse 30, and it says this, He must increase and I must decrease. Can you say that with me? He must increase. increase and I, I must, must decrease. decrease. That's right, friends. Let's see if you can say this with us. Say it with us. Are Here you we go. ready? Let's do it. John chapter mm -hmm. 3, verse 30, 30 says this. He, he must, must increase, increase and, and I, I must decrease. decrease. That's right. Very good. John the Baptist knew that Jesus is the most important and John wanted his life to glorify Jesus and not himself. Great job. Thank you, Miss Christine. Oh, you're Good so job, welcome. Kids. Good job, friends. All right, Tammy, the next thing that we have is our big picture question and we've been practicing this big picture question. Today in our story, we'll learn that Jesus faced temptation because Jesus is fully human. Our big picture question helps us understand the Father's plan. Why did Jesus become human? Jesus became human to obey his Father's plan and rescue sinners. Because the fair payment of sin is death. The only way for sinners to be saved is through the death of a perfect sacrifice. Because Jesus is fully human but never sinned, he was able to be the perfect sacrifice that we needed. Wow. Isn't that great, Tammy? Yes, it sure is. It's such great news for us. Our story today is about sin. And sin is what you were talking about, Tammy, when you said that you're tempted all the time. I am always getting in trouble. I try not to, but I can't help myself. Oh man, I know. Sin is anything that we do or say or think that goes against God. Sometimes sin hurts people and sometimes it hurts us, but all sin makes God sad. We all sin, we all make wrong choices, such as disobeying our parents. Isn't that what you were talking about? Yeah, that, that's the big one for me. Well, guess what? You're not the only one that has a hard time with that. Really? We all have a hard time with really? that. Really? But God had a rescue plan to save us from that. Sometimes we hurt our friends by saying or doing mean things. We think things when we're angry. We, sometimes we think things that are wrong. But Jesus was tempted and never sinned. The devil tried to get Jesus to sin, but Jesus never sinned. Wow. I know, he always did the right thing. Jesus died on the cross to rescue us from sin. We learned about that last week on Easter. Because Jesus never sinned, God can forgive us for our sin. He can help us say no to sin when we are tempted to, just like you were talking about. That is great news. I don't want to sin. Me either. Well, guess what? I brought some rocks today. Rocks? Look at these rocks we have. Look, well, look at, look at those. Those, those, are, those are just regular rocks. I know. What kinds of things would we do with rocks? What do you think, Tammy? Well, I should say that we should skip them, but, but I could break some windows too, you know. That's true. Skipping rocks is fun. Well, what else could we do with these rocks? Well, my brother's got a bat. We could bat those rocks. We could bat them in the field. Oh, that would be fun, maybe. Rocks are kind of hard. They might break something. What do you think? Well, I might know something about a few broken windows. Yeah, well, guess what? In our Bible story today, the devil wanted Jesus to turn rocks into bread. 
Boy. Listen to our story and let's hear what Jesus had to say about that. So our story this morning is in Matthew, Luke, and Mark, and it's about when Jesus was tempted just like you were tempted, Tammy. Listen to this story. After Jesus was baptized, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasted. He ate nothing during those days. When those days were over, he was hungry. The devil came to Jesus. He knew Jesus was very hungry, so he said, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil then took Jesus to the holy city of Jerusalem. There he had him stand on the highest point of the temple. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will give his angels orders about you. They will hold you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus told him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. Then the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And the devil said to him, I will give you all the riches and power of these kingdoms. You have given them to me, and I can give them to anyone I want. It will be yours if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. After the devil had finished every temptation, he left Jesus for a time. Then the angels came and began to serve Jesus. What do you think, Tammy? Does that sound like something that you can relate to? I, I'm just amazed that Jesus was able 40 days with nothing to eat, and he was able to resist the temptation of them rocks. I know. I love that. It's so encouraging to us. Everyone who trusts in Jesus is a new creation. God forgives our sins and gives us new hearts that love and want to obey God. God also sends the Holy Spirit to live in us and to fill us with his power. We will still be tempted to sin like what you're talking about, Tammy. But with the Holy Spirit, we can choose to obey God. The devil tried to get Jesus to sin, but Jesus never sinned. He always did the right thing. Jesus died on the cross to rescue us from sin. And when we're tempted to sin, we can ask Jesus to help us say no to sin. What do you think about that? Je Jesus will help me not to sin? Yes, I love that he's our helper and can help us do that. And he understands when we feel like we're tempted to sin. That's great news. I'm not alone. Jesus is with me and he's going to help me to overcome my temptation. I'm going to go to bed at 930. You just wait and see, Miss Christine. Yay, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you, friends, for joining us this morning. It was so nice to meet you, Tammy. Thank you, Miss Christine. It was nice meeting you, and I just thank you for encouraging me to stand against temptation. You are so welcome. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Sean Ratcliffe, student minister here at First Christian Church Union. I'd like to welcome you to another 212 edition of the stream, our little segment here. Uh, I'd like to begin first by saying that we had a great week last week. We looked at 1 Corinthians 15 and, and just really how crucial the resurrection is to the Christian faith and how beautiful it is that we have such a long list of witnesses, uh, over 500 eyewitnesses. And that's just the men. That doesn't count the women and the children who, who, are, who literally seen the risen Savior. And that's just a beautiful thing and that our, our faith is not a blind faith, but it's built on tangible evidence, tangible proofs. Last week we did The Price is Right and uh, after... A long, a long list of products. Bailey Bacon emerged as our, as our victor and won a $5 gift card to DQ. Uh, she'll be, uh, I'm sure, enjoying. And we look forward to getting together again this week. So uh, today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 6. And we're going to be starting in verse 46. While you get there, this, this verse, this passage, finds itself just right on the heels of the Beatitudes as, as the Lord is, is really given his longest sermon uh, over the course of his, his ministry. And, and as he gets up, he builds up to this point, and this is where we're at right here, starting in verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? 
Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug a deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose and the stream broke against the house and it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them, he's like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house is great. So we're looking and the Lord is talking about doing, living out his commands. Uh, we see this reflected again later on in James 1.22. Be doers of the word and not just hearers. But what does that really look like for you and I? Well, th the good news is, I mean, Christ had lots to say and lots to teach. Uh, but he kind of, he, he gave us, gives us this gift in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. He's approached and he really gives us this, this summary of all of, of all of God's teachings and our instructions on living this life. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus responds, and he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Our foundation is built when we take Christ's word, this, this beautiful book that we have is just full, full of wisdom. And we put it into application in our lives as we seek Him and seek His will, to really seek His kingdom in this earth right now and, and to step in line as Christians. That's what you and I are called to do. So I just want to encourage each and every one of you. Do we, look down? We, we can go down to these two things. If we can just get these two things right. First and foremost, let's get our hearts set, our minds focused on God above all things. Not our cell phone. I know I'm talking to you students, man. This is hard. Put down the cell phone. Pick the book up. You can do it. I know you can. Let's, let's get our priorities first thing together in the morning. Let's get up. Let's get in the Word. Let's set God first above all things. And then let's look around. Let's look around us. Let's, let's put these principles into action. Let's, let's look for those people that we can love and that we can really show Christ to as we walk through. And you know... Yeah, we can go to Africa. We, we could go to the Ukraine with, with Leah. We can go down to Ninos to Mexico. But how about we do this? Are you ready? Right in our own house. Just a thought. There's your thought for the week. I want to challenge each and every one of you this week to do something for Christ for another person in your house. Look for that opportunity. I promise it'll be there. God is faithful and he, he will raise up something that hits you like a bolt of lightning. And, and when that happens, I just encourage you to press into him and press into that situation and to do it in love for his glory. And I promise it'll be a blessing to you. So let's pray, and I'll pass you off to Rob, who's going to lead us in uh, another song. And, and we're going to look at, at some more foundations here later on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Um, thank you for, for giving us instructions. that We, we don't want to be houses toppled over every time the, the, it rains outside. Or we want to be built on that firm foundation. Help. Thank you for helping us to understand what that foundation looks like and how we can live in, a, live in this world in a way that pleases you, honors you, and blesses other people. Uh, please empower us to do that this week. Please be with us. Please continue to keep us safe and, and healthy. And Lord, I, you know, as soon as you will, I, I, we look forward to the day where we can gather back together corporately and to just to praise and worship together face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, grace and peace to each of you guys in the week ahead. And uh, take it away, Rob. Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you again to worship together. As strange as this is, what an amazing thing that we can come around in our homes and still worship and sing praise to Jesus. This morning, as we gather for worship, as we continue to worship, I want to encourage you. Jesus reminded the disciples there was two foundations that you can build your life on. You can build your life on the sand, and when the winds and the waves of this world come crashing in, that foundation will come crumbling down. Or you can build your life on the foundation that is Jesus Christ, which is the rock. And when the winds and the waves of this world come crashing down upon you, you will remain standing. Why? Because Jesus is our firm foundation. So with that in mind, let's lift our hearts and minds in worship this morning. of every song we could ever sing and worthy of all the praise we could
could ever bring and worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you in Jesus the name above every other name in Jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes. continue to worship, I want to remind you of this verse um, that's something that sets the course of our life. He's, Paul wrote the Roman church in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. He said, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Friends, we get to abound in hope, and the hope is nothing that we bring to the table, but is putting our faith in Jesus. Let's sing about that and worship together this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope 
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for putting your righteousness on our lives, giving us an everlasting hope that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence and with boldness, knowing that Christ finished the work on our behalf. God, I pray, Lord, as John comes and preaches through your word, Holy Spirit, may you come and move in a powerful way. May we hear these words. May we take stock of our lives. May we look deeply into our own hearts. Lord, may you continue to change us into the likeness of Jesus, to love each other the way you love us, to serve one another the way you served us. Draw our affection towards you this morning, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us again this week. I am still looking forward to the day that we can get back together and enjoy our time in fellowship, just holding hands and, and uh, hugging and just being able to encourage one another face to face. But until then, I'm just glad that you're able to be here and to watch and to take part in our worship this morning as we're uh, putting this out on Facebook. Uh, continue to, to pray that soon we can have this moment, something that will be passed, and we can move on in, in a close relationship not only with each other but also with God. This morning I want to take you to the book of Mark, chapter 14, beginning in verse 10. And it says, Then Judas Iscariot who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Of all the faces about the cross, 
this face, I think, really is, is one that's, that we see, it's, it's tragic. It's more than just tragic. It's, it's something unique about it that really causes us to, to lack an understanding and gives us some perplexity about it. Those who've stared into the face of Judas have often come away with a, a different impression of, of who he is. A few of the, the people see Judas as this blundering and mistaken hero trying to, to help conquer the world, but most people see him as somebody who was a little bit different than that. He was more of a, an inhuman scoundrel, and, and, and they shut their eyes to see any good that he might have possibly had in him at all. They, they remember only one single act of his pathetic life, and that is his betrayal of our Lord Jesus. Well, this morning, I think it seems to me that it's not quite fair that we always look at him that way. So I want us to, to, to take another look at him today and see him maybe through a different pair of spectacles and to see him as, as if we could forget just that one moment in life that was so dark and look at him in a different way. But how could we do this? Who is Judas? I guess that's really the first question we ought to ask ourselves. Who is this man that, that nobody ever wants to name their children after anymore? Judas, he wasn't a monster. Uh, he was simply a man. A man very much like you and me, but, but really that's not saying much. Sometimes those who are decent and, and, and respectable, they, they are prone to look at others who aren't that way through a set of eyes that see them as people who are made up of a, a material that's so different than us, made up of, of some other slime or undesirable thing rather than the fine material that we ourselves are created in. It's hard for us to, to realize the similarities and the commonality that we each have with Judas because we are like him in a lot of different ways. And yet... He, he was one who was willing to sell out and betray his Lord. G. Campbell Morgan, he's a prolific British evangelist, a preacher, a, a leading Bible teacher and, and, and author uh, during the late 19th and early 20th century. I, I enjoy reading his sermons and some of his writings, but, but I don't tend to agree with the statement that he makes here. As he begins to speak about Judas, he says this. He says, I do believe that Judas was a man in the ordinary sense of the word. I believe that he was a devil incarnate, created in history for the nefarious work that was hell's work. I mean, there, no doubt through history there have, been, there have been a lot of people who feel the same way about Judas. But I find that hard to agree with that statement, that he wasn't a man, that he was something or someone created for this, this task. I mean, that kind of explanation raises a lot more questions than it does give answers to us. If Judas were created as an incarnate devil, if he were sent into this world to be the traitor of Jesus, then really he's not to blame for what he has done, and we shouldn't look bad upon him. And then we have to ask ourselves, then, under those circumstances, who then really is to blame? And the only answer we can give would be God. But I can't accept that either. God has never created any man, either a monster or, or a devil, traitors and scoundrels are, are not born, but I think they are made from their choices that they themselves make in life. So, Judas wasn't a monster, but he was a man, but yet, I don't think he was always a traitor either. Certainly, Judas was born... Uh, with the condition that we are, but I don't think we would look at him and see the guilt of treachery upon his soul. I mean, when his mother looked at his, his tender eyes as a child, I don't think she saw treachery and, and betrayal within those eyes. She just looked at him with love, and, and just like any other mother would look at him. But no more was he a traitor in the early days of his discipleship with Jesus. I mean, there's probably some who think that, that, that Judas began with this idea that he was going to betray Jesus, and he slipped himself into that. But some people probably thought that he had to, had to been a traitor from the beginning. But the Scripture does not even give us any indication of that whatsoever. Yet, a year before his betrayal, before Jesus went to the cross, Jesus made this statement in John chapter 6, verse 70. He said, did I not choose you, the twelve? 
Yet one of you is a devil. The real meaning of this statement, a devil, diabolos in Greek, it's one that, that gives us the idea of, of one who's an accuser, a, a slanderer, a liar, or, or that could be devilish in his nature. And at that time, Judas was facing the wrong direction in life. But even then, Jesus doesn't say that he's entirely bad. Matter of fact, Jesus never mentions that he's completely bad at all. I mean, the fact that that horrific deed filled him with such utter remorse at the end of his life suggests that there's still just a part of him that had a little bit of hope, possibly. When Jesus said that Judas was devilish, he was only saying what we often say about one another. His criticism was certainly even harsher when he spoke to Peter. Remember those wonderful words that Peter made back in Matthew chapter 16 and, and verse 16? He said that, that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it wasn't but a moment later. Matter of fact, just seven verses later, Jesus says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. But I don't think Peter was Satan himself, even though Jesus said that. And neither was Judas. You see, even though it's a sharp and a cutting statement as it can be, the words that Jesus makes about Judas and about Peter, it doesn't mean that there is no hope for them. But in Judas' case, something changed. Judas, he became a traitor. But he was not one, really, from the beginning. So what was he? Well, I tend to think that Judas possibly was a friend. He was one of the friends of Jesus. I mean, he began to follow Jesus early on as, as the disciples would follow Jesus, and the crowds would follow Jesus. And, and, and he followed him of his own free will. Because there was something about Jesus that just attracted him to him. How they met, the Bible doesn't tell us. We really don't know. Judas wasn't a Galilean, he was a Judean, and so he wasn't even really from the area in which Jesus was living at the time and, and, and making his, his hometown up in Capernaum. But Judas makes his way there because he heard of Jesus and he wants to know about him. And one day they stand face to face, and one day they look into each other's eyes and perhaps Judas stood on the very fringe of a crowd as he heard Jesus speak. And he may have heard Jesus speak those words that are recorded to us there in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, when he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself daily and take up his cross and follow me. Maybe it was those words that Judas thought, I've got to follow him. And the conditions must have seemed hard to a man like Jesus, who we eventually think of as the one who is a lover of money. But the truth is, Judas turned his back on his business. He turned his back on his income and his finances, and he becomes a disciple of Jesus. And he's going to walk with him and, and go with him everywhere he goes for the next three years. And ultimately, Jesus then not only recognized him as one of his disciples, but he calls him as an apostle, one that he is going to send out into this world. And, and there's something about Jesus that made this irresistible for Judas to turn away from. And so he follows him. I, I think there are some people who might suggest that Judas became a disciple, maybe with mixed motives. But if we get into the realm of motives, I don't think anyone can stand certainly not us, certainly not any of the disciples, the, the fellow disciples of Judas. I mean, James and John, they come to Jesus one day uh, hiding behind the skirts of their mother and they're asking if there's any way that they can be set up in positions of power to his right and to his left. And the other disciples, they get upset about that and they're indignant because, not because James and John asked, but quite possibly because they didn't ask themselves first. And so we have to look at Judas at one time, he was a very friendly individual with Jesus. He was a close friend of Jesus. Not only that, but when we think about it, he was, he was trustworthy and he was faithful because of his own choice. He then becomes his follower of Jesus. Second, I believe that Jesus was a friend, not only because he chose to follow him, but because the Master chose him as well. 
Jesus didn't have to choose him. I'm sure there were probably some other people who were more worthy to be a disciple of, of Jesus. But yet Jesus chose him specifically. I ask myself, why, why would Jesus have chose him? I'm sure he didn't choose Judas because he was some rascal. I mean, a good man doesn't select their friends based upon the, uh, their, their lack of moral character. I, I don't really want to believe that Jesus chose him because he knew when he first saw him that this is the man that's going to betray me, so I need to make sure he comes along with me. I think possibly Jesus chose him just as he chose the other disciples because he saw within Judas possibility. I think we can be sure that Judas was at one time a friend because he was regarded as one by the other disciples as well. I mean, they trusted him enough to make him the treasurer of their, all their finances. And when Jesus sent them out two by two, I'm sure that, that he did his work just as much as they did, that he was there casting out demons and he was healing people and he was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God is at hand. And he was just like all of them. And, and had that been who he really was at that point, I'm sure that John and Matthew, the other disciples who write the Gospels, they would have made mention somehow about how Judas was this nefarious, treacherous person. But yet, they don't even make mention of it. They don't even give hint until the very end about their suspicions. And you see, Judas, even at the end, was not suspect to be the one who would betray them. Listen what had happened at the Last Supper in Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 20. When it was evening, Jesus, he reclined at the table with the twelve, and as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were, they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after another, Is it I, Lord? They all thought that they could have been the one to have betrayed him. They didn't all turn and point their fingers at Judas and say, Yeah, he's the man. He was furthest from their thoughts. And even when he got up from the table and he left, they even indicated that maybe he was going out for some errand that Jesus had sent him on, maybe to go buy food or to, to pay for something. We, they didn't know. But none of them suspected that Judas was, even at that moment, was the one that would betray Jesus. I think of all these reasons, I think they helped me understand that Judas was once considered a loyal friend rather than always being thought of as the traitor. So how does Judas... How does he become this traitor? Well, I think some would suggest that if he wasn't always a traitor, maybe he was mistaken about Jesus. And they believe that in spite of this heartless conduct here at the end, that he deeply, truly loved Jesus at one point. Not only so, but that he trusted him with a faith that was more daring than any of the other disciples might have had. Because, see, they declared that they believed in Jesus with such an absolute conviction that he was sure that if maybe, if, if confronted with a situation where Jesus was trapped, that he would then have to do something to prove that he was the Son of God and, and that he would all of a sudden command the kingdom of God to be established. And so with that type of faith, Judas may have decided to put Jesus on the spot and so he created a situation where Jesus would have to exercise his power and his authority and assume his role as conqueror. Naturally, I think all of us would probably want that to have been the case. But the trouble is, there's no evidence in Scripture that that's true. I mean, all the evidence points in the opposite direction. I mean, evangelists through the centuries who have preached the gospel message and they bring Judas into it, they, they speak of him merely not as a misguided or mistaken man, but one who was deliberately treacherous in his actions here at the end. But there's even more convicting still. Jesus himself, whose loving eye always somehow saw the best in a man, he makes no excuses for Judas. Matter of fact, 
Jesus, who's even apologizing for the soldiers who are murdering him upon this cross, there in Luke 23, he, he asks his father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. But he has no word of excuse for this traitor. He doesn't regard him as a man who, though misguided zeal, did some kind of foolish thing, but, but one who through wickedness of heart did a treacherous and a devilish thing. So how then can we explain Judas? Well, there's not a whole lot written about him, so we have to guess. We can take into context everything around it, and we can come up with our own opinions about him. And I think of this we can be sure. There, there came a day when Judas turned his face away from Jesus, and he took that first step down the wrong road. Maybe it seemed a, a trivial matter at first, but by the end it was a tragedy. Let me tell you that the direction in which we travel is the most important fact about us all. You see, what we are, I believe, is of importance. But what we are becoming is really something of greater importance. If we are facing the right direction, then really there's no telling how Christ-like that we might become in this life. And we have the whole eternity to climb that mountain. But if we're facing in the wrong direction, ever so slightly, there's no telling what depths of depravity we might discover ourselves into. Just being off course one degree. And in the course of history, eternal. Judas, for some reason, he chose to take the wrong path. He was not only in, in the, the steps that were false that, that he took, but Judas was the only disciple that wasn't a Galilean. I mean, that in and of itself offered a soil in, in which the choking weeds of jealousy might grow. And so when he looks at, at the other disciples, and maybe it was one day as he's sitting there, he began to think about these things, and it began to come clear to Judas that all the other disciples, they had something in common with Jesus and, and his confidence in them. And Jesus began to take certain ones aside and entered into a, a circle of friendship that nobody else was in. And, and maybe Judas wanted to be in the inner circle, but... Maybe it's just because he wasn't a Galilean. I mean, this inner circle was composed of that blundering idiot, Peter, and those two hot-headed and temperamental brothers, those sons of thunder, James and John. And, and Judas, he considered himself probably very bright, probably very intelligent, one of the, one of the best of these men. He was more, probably more trained in, in economics and things than any of these other guys. And so he probably thought well of himself, and, and yet he's not included in the inner circle. In all probability, there was this huge disappointment of Judas. Not only so, but it, it doubtlessly aroused within, arise, arises within him a resentment that grew more and more bitter with the passing of days. And this resentment was further increased by the fact that things aren't probably turning out the way that Judas had hoped they would. You see, when he began to follow Jesus, he was sure that this master was going to establish a kingdom here in this world and was going to restore to Jerusalem and to Israel the rightful throne of the kingdom and to overthrow the government of Rome off their shoulders. And here was this man that he's met who's going to set his people free and he, he's going to enable his nation to put its foot upon the neck of its enemies and, and he's going to conquer them, those who had already been conquered. But, but here again, he is met with disappointment. While Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and everybody is shouting and proclaiming him to be the king of kings, and, and they're singing Hosanna in the highest, and they're looking forward to his entrance there, and, and he is fulfilling all the scriptures coming in, they're probably thinking, now is the time. And so what happens? Judas recognizes that Jesus stops right there on the Mount of Olives, and he, he begins to cry, and he begins to weep, over this city. This isn't the king that he's wanting. This king seems more defeated than conquering. 
And Jesus does nothing more than weep over a city which he should have conquered? Maybe in disappointment in his own personal advancement and in the prospects of a worldly kingdom, Judas perhaps decides to get out of this mad adventure and get whatever little he could with him. And therefore he began to steal from the group's finances. Of course, he didn't call it stealing. Maybe he thought, I'll pay it back in, in time and, and, and everything will be okay. And Then he told himself that what he took was probably the best probably payment for what he has done because after all, he's, he deserves this. He's given up his business. He's given up his livelihood and he could have made a lot more if he had stayed back where he was rather than following Jesus. And so this is really due him. But for whatever his reason was to begin to steal, he began to steal. And while Judas is soothing his conscience with these little lies, while he is deceiving his fellow disciples, he realizes that there is one whom he is not deceiving. Jesus. Maybe he felt that Jesus knew him for who and what he was. He was disappointed and and grief in those kindly eyes that read to the very depths of his soul and they knew his heart and his inner thoughts. And so he begins to find himself extremely uncomfortable every time he's around Jesus and just wondering, what is Jesus thinking? Maybe he knows, does he really suspect, is he, whatever it is. And so he begins to build in with him this resentment and this, this hatred and, and it changes. And he puts the blame on Jesus rather than himself because Jesus is the one who's not doing what he's supposed to do to become king. And therefore he begins to hate this one-time friend with a deadly passion. And it's so intense that his hatred, that finally he says to the enemies of Jesus as they enter into that passion week, that final week of Jesus. And in Matthew 26, 15 he says, what will you give me if I turn him and deliver him over to you? What was the price? 30 pieces of silver. What a measly amount of money, 30 pieces of silver. I mean, that's the price that you would give to buy a slave. No doubt Judas probably expected more. But his seducers, these Pharisees, these priests, these teachers of the law, they had him at their mercy. And he had betrayed Jesus into their hands. And now there's no going back. Therefore, he, he takes the money. Because, after all, 30 pieces of silver is 30 pieces of silver, right? And and here's a little side note. The temple treasury in which they pay him out of is the same treasury in which they are to purchase the lambs for sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. The irony in that, that the Lamb of God, who would be sacrificed for your sins and for mine on that Day of Atonement, was purchased the betrayal of Judas, Jesus, the Lamb of God. But I don't think greed was likely his primary goal for betraying Jesus. I mean, had it been the case, I don't think he would have kissed him. And and that kiss, that kiss, there's something more about that than just finger pointing out the master to his enemies. The word kiss, katafileo, it's used... In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, six times in the Bible is all it used. And it insinuates more than just a a mere peck on the cheek. It, It insinuates a passionate kiss that seems to have no end. And in these six times in Scripture that it's used, three times it's in reference to Judas's kiss. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all use it. It's used another time, once in the book of Acts, when it's describing... The elders of the church in Ephesus, when they were trying to say goodbye to Paul, and they realized they're never going to see him again. And their emotion is they just won't want him to stop. They don't want him to leave. The other experience is when Luke writes in the Gospel of Luke about this sinful woman who comes in and interrupts a dinner party in which Jesus is at. And she's there at his feet and she's weeping and she's crying and her tears fall upon his feet. And so she gets down on the floor and she wipes his feet with her hair. And then she begins to passionately katafileo his feet. The 
this kiss, it doesn't have that passion, but rather it has poison. I mean, it's venomous. Jealous, disappointed, greedy Judas has now come to hate Jesus so much that he, he betrays him with this passionate, poisonous kiss. So what can we say about the destiny of this pathetic man? I mean, where is he now? And on this area, surprisingly, the Bible really doesn't say much. I think there are three things we can look at. We, we can look at what Peter's opinion was of it, because he tells us in, in the book of Acts, when he begins to communicate with the other disciples about replacing Judas, listen to what he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 25. Peter tells us that Judas went to his own place. Well, that states it rather delicately, doesn't it? It really doesn't give us a whole lot. He doesn't say that Judas plunged into the eternal uh, abyss. He only says that he went out to meet the destiny that he had prepared for himself. He went to his own place. I mean, we enter into a door, each one of us, for which we are ready. If we prepare ourselves for the companionship with Christ, then that relationship we will have. But if we prepare ourselves for the companionship of those who hate what is best and they love what is the worst, into that companionship we shall go also. We each go to our own place. So it was with Judas. I think we can listen to the words of Jesus as he uh, tries to explain as well. So what does Jesus think about the destiny of this traitor, his betrayer? Well, before the betrayal took place, Jesus knew that Judas was not his friend, yet he refuses to dismiss him. He knew that if love and patience could not save him, isolation and ostracization and and, and indifference would surely fail as well. But Judas makes this impossible. So in his last prayer, Jesus, as he is there in Gethsemane, that long, dark night following the Last Supper, he speaks these revealing words. John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. The scriptures might be fulfilled. The son of destruction. Some translations have it, the son of perdition. Well, that's Judas. And with infinite heartache, Jesus says, I've lost him. I don't think there can be any more tragic words than that. Jesus realizes he has lost Judas. I think we can also observe the reaction of Judas himself. After the kiss, Judas expected to go his way, but but he can't do it. And, and, and his, his fatal fascination draws him to the trial of Jesus, and he sits through there listening, and finally he hears that this man that he has betrayed is sentenced to death, and that, that terrible reaction sets in. I mean, it's, it's awful to think of, of the suffering of this desperate man, and the, the very flames of hell are kindled, and, and they're, they're ready for him. And infinitely, the most awful hour of his life is upon him and he has needed help before but never has his need been so crushing as it is right now i mean where does he turn in his hour of need i mean i mean that really is a searching question for us i mean the answer is that will give us a look into the very heart of this man where do we go when the skies are black when life for us has fallen into the ruins we seek help from any kind of source that is out there Some of us, we turn to alcohol and drugs, and others, they turn to God. But Judas, in his hour of need, turns not to Jesus, but to the heartless devils that have wrecked his soul. I don't think I can think of any more revealing nor tragic fact than that. He saw himself as hopeless, as doomed at this point in life. And it shows 
it shows us the effect of Judas's sin upon himself. He has so blinded himself to the mercy and the goodness of Jesus that at his blackest hour he sees that there is no more hope in the worst of men than in love incarnate. There can be no longer any place for them to, to turn. There can be no hotter hell than this. And in the blindness is a danger that threatens not only Jesus, but every one of us. We can refuse to see until our eyes finally close at last time. So where do we go when our foundation is shaken? Where do you turn when, when that which you have built your life upon is crumbling before you? So ignorant was I, I did not know there was a God. My Sundays were spent on the streets of London in play. I mean, those are the words of Edward Mote. Edward rose from an unruly childhood and he became a great writer and a minister. He composed only one song, but a song so great that it is one that we have kept through the years. It has been a favor to people from around the world. And in his early adult years, Mote attended Tottingham Court Road Chapel where he'd heard the sermons by the noted preacher John Hyatt. And and he soon learned from Hyatt's sermons that Jesus Christ could take away his sins and could remove all the fears of life and give him the peace of heart and the mind that he had so long desired. Mote became a, a carpenter's apprentice and through hard labor and conscious efforts, he eventually owned his own cabinet shop. And one day, while walking to his shop, he began thinking that that he should write a hymn. Before he reached his shop, he had the chorus in mind. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Before the day ended, he had four stanzas written. And the following Sunday, he was visiting in the home of of a friend, a minister whose wife was on her deathbed. And and during the afternoon, they they were reading from the scriptures, and and they prayed with her. And and as the preacher looked around the the place to find a hymnal from which they could sing some songs for her, he he couldn't find one. And so, so Mote pulled out of his pocket this song that he had just written. And he asked if he might sing it to her. And so it was agreed. She seemed to enjoy the hymn very much. And he was so pleased that she found comfort in the verses that he copied it a thousand times. And he printed it out for distribution for other people to have. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Sometime later, Edward Mote became a Baptist preacher. And his efforts in his woodworking and stuff made it possible for them to have a house of worship built for the congregation. And they were so grateful that they offered him the deed to the property. But he replied, I do not want the chapel. I want only the pulpit. And when I cease to preach Christ, then turn me out of that. He served his congregation for for more than 20 years, never missing a single Sunday for any reason at all. And in his 77th year, as he lay on his deathbed, he said, I think I'm going to heaven. Yes, I'm nearing port. The truths I have preached I am now living upon, and they will do to die upon. Ah, the precious blood which takes away all our sins. It is this which makes peace with God. What a victorious ending to a useful life. He was reared in a godless home. He learned an honorable trade and he gave it all up to become a minister, a preacher of the gospel. And his memory will remain for generations because he took time one day to write a simple hymn. Matthew 7, 24 says this, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them 
will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I pray that you never turn your back on Jesus. That you fully trust him to the very moment of your last breath. That you will see in him the Messiah. Not one that has had earthly kingdom, but the one in this earth who created a kingdom that is eternal and is in heaven. And it is into that kingdom that he calls you to live. And it is through his name and his name alone that you can enter. Put your faith and your trust in him. Don't betray him. Don't be a Judas. Be like Edward Mote and recognize the blood of Jesus covers over all your sins. And putting your faith and your trust in Him is what you live upon and you can die upon. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that You've given us a character such as Judas that we can examine in life. And Father, He's just like us. He saw the potential of being with Jesus and what Jesus could possibly have done for Him. And yet, he turned and he walked away. But it wasn't just the walking away, it was the betrayal that creates such a conflict. And Father, may we never be like that. May we never turn our eyes and our face away from Jesus, but we will walk toward him, keeping our focus and our attention on him always, until that moment when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, we, we're amazed that you would love us enough that Jesus would have gone to the cross even for our sins, let alone for the sins of Judas. But may we receive it as a gift freely given. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Glad that you were able to join us. In just a moment, Alan is going to come and, and uh, share with us our time of communion. And I pray that as you focus on the bread and, and the cup, that Jesus creates this new covenant with us about. That you and your family will realize the importance of that gift and the significance even of the betrayal that had to take place so that Jesus could offer himself for you and for me. God bless you all. Thank you, John, for that message this morning. And as we uh, come to our time of communion together, celebrating the, the Lord's Supper, if uh, you desire to join in at this time and uh, with this celebration, this would be a good opportunity to get your uh, juice and your bread together. And as we've mentioned before in past times, that if you just have a, a salting cracker or just any kind of bread there or juice there in your home, you can substitute that and. Uh, for the grape juice and as we share together this morning and uh, gather together with your family and your friends and maybe your neighbors are there ce celebrating with us this morning. I'd like to take our uh, message of our thoughts this morning on the Lord's Supper from uh, Luke, the 22nd chapter. Actually, the, the section starts in uh, verse 7 and goes to 13, verse 13. There's quite a bit of activity here. Jesus is the Passover is coming. Jesus has asked his disciples to go out and prepare the meal for the Passover. And he has a bunch of instructions. He gets them ready for the meal. And this specific section of scripture starts in verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. And there's kind of an interesting statement there of choice of words there. He really enjoyed this time to be able to be with them. More mainly because this sort of closes beginning of the end of his earthly ministry and really sort of ties the bow together on all the things that he's done over the past three years. But he also says to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So there's other parts of this. It's a joyous celebration of the close, but also the cross before him. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until I find fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So he says, so he enters this, all. this is now, but also for the future. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you, the bread. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. 
And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, or the Passover supper, he gave the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Here's a question for you as we partake together. What would you say is your favorite meal? Some favorite special meal that you might remember? Um, tell you the truth, I'd be kind of hard-pressed to come up with a favorite meal. Um, I've lived in, I really, when all things considered, I would not have said this, but when I know about a lot more about the world, I've lived in a place of quite a bit of abundance. I've been able to have a variety of meals. Not every country is able to say that. Many people are limited to just a, a limited amount of food, and then often the very same meal is eaten meal after meal. But even there in those countries, there are moments of celebration when something special is prepared, and there's a special meal, maybe for a special celebration or a special family celebration or a wedding celebration or something like that. And, but I have to say this, I have to make sort of a confession here. I, I am not a foodie. I'm not a gourmet. And uh, I have been able to enjoy some wonderful meals. My wife is a wonderful cook. And uh, she brings a lot of variety to the table. And she loves to find variety in different meals. And uh, so I, I've been really sp uh, spoiled in enjoying a lot of different variety. But when I remember favorite meals, I have to tell you, I don't remember exactly what that food was. But I, there's a common denominator, though. I remember who I had those meals with. That becomes the real key of a favorite meal, was the occasion and who that occasion was with in, in, in that meal. And, the, and when you come to the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And so when we remember the Lord in the Lord's Supper, there's a couple things to remember. One, it was an intimate meal. We celebrate intimate meals. We've had moments of those one-on-one -on -one candlelight meals with someone special, where there's been an intimate conversation. And Jesus is also, when we take the Lord's Supper together, it's an intimate time. It's also a family time. Now, we're not together as we're taking this. Maybe you're together there in the family. Maybe you feel really together during the uh, shelter in place or the lockdown. Uh, and there's been some difficult moments of being together, but that's part of family. And when we get back together and celebrate the Lord's Supper on Sunday together, we'll be really doing some tremendous rejoicing together as the family of Christ. And then... Uh, many times and meals that we might remember. I remember some uh, uh, maybe upscale restaurant meals with some special people at some special occasions, you know, which my grandparents probably never celebrated in an upscale uh, setting, but uh, probably would never pay for in an upscale setting. But what made it really special was, again, the people that I was with. And when we come to the Lord's Supper, we remember the price of the meal, the forgiveness of sin, and the price of forgiveness on the cross of Christ. And then we remember special meals because of times of celebration. One thing we can celebrate when we take the Lord's Supper together this morning, celebrate like the Luke 15 and the prodigal son coming home and the celebration of the homecoming I was once lost, but now I'm found. When you take the Lord's Supper together in your home today, that you're remembering this, you're remembering that you have been found, your whole family have been, has been found, and now you celebrate together, once lost, but now found. And also when we take food together, and those great meals together, with those wonderful special people together, there's always some of the leftovers there and they're put in the fridge. And unless they're processed and moved out, there's that funny stuff that starts growing over those things in the fridge. Even those best of meals, 
that we remember and celebrate together, they perish. But what we remember in the Lord's Supper, it's an imperishable meal. It's going to last forever. And the celebration will take us from here to eternity, to the wedding feast of the Lamb, imperishable. My, in a world today, when we think of things that perish and fall apart, we remember the imperishable. And as we take this bread together, and as we take this cup, this is a meal to remember. To remember his body on the cross. And this juice. The life he gave for us. It is a, me a meal to remember. A meal that will delight us. Maybe, is there some special favorite meal? Maybe this meal is our most favorite meal. When we remember now and for eternity, we shall delight in remembering this meal. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for this time of, rem of remembrance. We remember you, your intimate, personal way with us, knowing us personally, calling us by name. In the family of Christ, the precious cost that we could not pay and the moment of celebration that we shall celebrate with you in an imperishable kingdom beyond sickness and disease, we shall be with you forever. In Christ's name, amen.